I'd just like to begin by saying what an honour it is to be giving the first Howard Rain Memorial Lecture. Uh, I always have a special regard as a historian of medicine, but I come from the historical side, for, for the place of the physician, the place of someone who really understands what it is to support and to communicate and to listen to patients. So I also feel that it's um, uh, particularly appropriate that um, um, I could that, uh, have the honour of addressing you on this topic. Um, the issue of internment is one which I think hasn't been looked at enough in certain respects um, because for the whole refugee experience of those who come to Britain and find refuge um, in the UK, internment hung over them. No, it's only a smaller proportion of people who are actually interned. But the risk of being hauled off by the police um, in a rather arbitrary way, which to totally interrupting your life when you'd just been beginning to resettle, um, was one that hung over the whole um, um, the whole population of refugees. Um, and there was, at the time of Dunkirk um, in 1940, um, there was wholesale dismissals of doctors and nurses from hospitals. Uh, I know also it, it was also not possible to establish your practice in coastal areas and so there was for example a dental surgeon from Vienna who had just set up, thought that he had just set up his surgery in Bournemouth in fact um, and um, he found that he, he, although he wasn't actually interned, he found that he couldn't practice and so that, that was, uh, it, it in a way cut off the um, what he what he had planned to do, uh, so that um, inter if one thinks about internment, it's really a roller coaster of ups and downs. It's uh, which goes uh, yes, of course, to, to have got out of the nightmare of um, whatever area you you were in under the control of the Nazis, to have experienced the whole. Um, the persecution and the persecution for doctors was really very intensive in being degraded as treaters of the sick, um, losing their um, status as physicians. To have been through that, to have acquired the right of, um, or the, to be able to just to be your first employment in a, in a hospital or your first steps in opening a practice and then for internment to come and to interrupt this was um, um, a very hard blow. Um, what lay behind this mass dismissals? It was a suspicion of a so-called fifth column that there was the idea that uh, it was an extraordinary idea without any um, ba any basis in fact that refugees might become a, um, a, a sort of a hidden um, vanguard of, in, of when there was a, a German invasion. That was, the, that was the fear. And this was something which MI5, the security services, were driving forwards. And, the, and this was a, a fear which the British Medical Association and the Royal College of Nurses used to their own advantage because what they wanted to do was to keep the refugee doctors and nurses in subordinate temporary positions. So you have a, I can say, it's a situation which is um, when a security fear and the security services take hold of the Ministry of Health, the, the Home Office, um, and they combine with the um, with established uh, with the with these very conservative um, professional organisations. Um, so, 
uh, the internment of refugees is, has been looked at, uh, Tony Kushner among them, actually, of the historians, have been, but been looked at from a political and a cultural perspective. And the cultural achievements in these adverse circumstances were considerable. I mean, they're wonderful works of art which were improvised um, under very difficult circumstances from just... Uh, there's one artist, Samson Shamas, who was actually a patient of my father's. He used to take the soil in the camp and make pigments for his paint, and uh, also debris, and he made wonderful mosaics, actually. Um, but there are medical aspects that are overlooked. So just a, a very straightforward question. What sort of medical care were, was there in the camps? Were the interned doctors and dental surgeons, were they allowed to practice? And what was the impact on the mental and physical health of the internees? I think they are, it, they're topics which are worth some consideration. Let me take two examples to, um, to begin this. One is of a psychiatrist who was born in Breslau, Arta Kassel, in 1897. He is heavily persecuted by the Nazis, has appeared in Buchenwald concentration camp. Then he is on a ship to, called the St. Louis, which, although the passengers on the ship hoped that they would be going to the United States, um, they in the end, they go to Cuba, where they're not allowed to land, and it's a shameful international uh, incident. Um, Arthur Castle, though, was one of the few given um, refuge in the United Kingdom. Some, were given, some, some of the passengers were taken in by the British and some by the Dutch. But then in 1940, he's interred, and then he finds himself on another ship, the Danira, being shipped off to Australia under really uh, demeaning and um, horrific <coughs> circumstances. After enduring all this, he decides to re remain in Australia, um, and he learns at the end of the war that his wife and two children haven't survived, and tragically he commits suicide in the Australian bush. So that's a very sad history of which internment is just one, one chapter in a, a sequence of, in a tragic sequence of events. I'll give you another example of a, an Austrian doctor. He's actually born in Romania, qualifies though in Vienna in 1929. He's a practitioner in Vienna, 1938. He's subjected to repeated arrests by the Gestapo. He manages to leave Aust uh, Vienna in April 1939 and has periods practicing at Queen's Park Hospital. He's first of all interned from the 21st of June to the 12th of September 1940. That's a very short internment. I think that must be one of the shortest. But he finds himself arrested by the Metropolitan Police for a second time from May 1942 to 6th of April 1944. He's back on the Isle of Man for a much longer period. So um, the question is why? There are Metropolitan Police records, and there are two things about his uh, internment. The first is that he was prosecuted and in prison, taken to prison and taken back to the Isle of Man uh, because he was practicing without full permission to practice. That was the first reason. And the second reason, which also gives sort of some pause for thought, is his return to Vienna. Those who returned to Vienna were mainly communists or left-wing socialists. It's very rare that you were not a communist and you were returning to Vienna at that time on the Russian zone. So here we see a situation whereby the, um, the, professionalize, the politics of professionalization, the antipathy to well-qualified refugees comes together with security concerns. 
Um, just on the, the document at the side comes from his Austrian compensation file. It's from the Home Office Aliens Department. Um, and um, uh, giving the, the dates of the exact dates when he, he was interned. So here we see it from the, um, the National Archives, the, um, his, his uh, Metropolitan Police file. You can see it's going to be open 1st of January 2018, so <laughs> I'd very, be very keen to have a, a look at it. Um, so the approach that I'll be taking to internment is that it's really, a, what's its place in the thousands of biographies? Because we, internment is really part of the sequence of persecution, dismissal, arrest, property, expropriation, uh, professional degradement, the stresses of migration, of finding somewhere to go, and then part of a process of requalification, resettlement, and, re and reconstructing your, your whole life, really. And the way I do it is to study the individual life histories. I'm a sort of grad, to, to look at, at the actual experiences. Um, and we find certain features of it, for example, Jewish gynecologists were heavily persecuted in um, Germany and, uh, and Austria. Uh, we find the, anybody who came after November 1938 that they will have experienced the widespread arrest and terror of the Kristallnacht pogrom, and then to be rearrested in the United Kingdom as this potential fifth colonist, I think, was an extremely distressing um, position to be in. The numbers of I call them medical refugees, but what I mean is physicians, dental surgeons, psychiatrists, others involved in healthcare like nurses. Nurses are especially important in the story. They're really quite large in, in Britain. So again, the history of refugees overall, if you look at them as a, as a group, is also a, a, a roller coaster because there are times when the British government is very, very restrictive and there are times when the restriction relaxes, particularly after the Kristallnacht, the Crystal Night pogrom. There was some relaxation and an understanding that people would want at least temporary refuge where they would be able to sort their lives out, for example, pending immigration to onward migration to um, the United States, for example. There is a very complex story of uh, regarding the obtaining of medical qualifications because the British Medical Association had from 1936 um, secured a restriction that even though you might have British qualifications but if you were a foreign national you couldn't necessarily practice in Britain. Um, but you could migrate onwards, and you could migrate to places like uh, Australia, Newfoundland, um, then a British um, colony still, um, or other countries like New Zealand, though. But the New Zealanders wouldn't accept the British qualifications. It's a complicated story. There was reciprocal recognition of Italian degrees. If you had an Italian degree, you could. You had the right to practice in Britain. Uh, and some refugees from Germany and Austria did take Italian degrees. There was, um, again, before the, Nazi, before the Italian fascists placed their, um, and their anti Semitic restrictions, there was enough time to go to Italy. Um, but there was certainly an overall opposition on the part of the British, British Medical Association and other medical associations, um, more, there's a more rank-and-file medical practitioners union. Um, but there is an enormous breakthrough in January 1941, which comes again into the internment story, that all of a sudden, in the UK, all foreign medical degrees are recognised, firstly on the temporary basis, then permanently. And this is the basis that most of the refugee practitioners, in fact, do make their careers. And I find even, for example, the Nazis abolished certain people's degrees. They 
did this, but on their abolished degree, you could still practice for the rest of your life. Many people didn't even know their degrees were abolished by the Nazis during the war. It was a, a strange position. And the Home Office and the Ministry of Health were caught up in this conflict between, the very, between this protectionist British Medical Association, also the British Dental Association was like that, and the social and scientific reformers. And there was a lobby in favor of the refugees a really very, very enlightened lobby who saw that the specialist and scientific skills of the refugees would be vital to modernizing health care and placing health care on a, say, a much more accessible basis. And this is the planning for a new national health service. So that comes into the, there is a, a politics going on there. But they're also, and again, looking at individual cases, here's one of Isidore Zilverman, who's employed as a psychiatrist by the Warwickshire and Coventry Mental Hospital. Um, prior to moving on to the US, and not only does the medical superintendent, does he praise his um, uh, skills and how much his devoted and unsparing efforts uh, were important, he says that actually, we knew it wasn't legal, but we still employed him because he was just so useful to have around. So there is also, I think what it shows is that if we contrast it to the other, uh, to, um, to the other doctor, how complicated Britain is, how many different experiences there are. And there is a lobby on the one side in favor of the refugees, they're hospitable, they're supportive, and another lobby who are very, very anti-refugee and don't want the refugees um, diluting the British medical profession. Um, as I said, working with a, a wider definition um, of anyone involved in healthcare and also including students, medical students, there are large numbers coming to Britain, and we wouldn't have such large numbers if there wouldn't be a supportive lobby, because every person who comes to the UK needed a guarantor, either an individual guarantor or a collective guarantor. Uh, for example, the, um, <coughs> with the Kitchener camp, for which was able to extract refugees out of concentration camps very, very effectively in 1939. Um, so the guarantor and guarantors could be really very supportive people with the authorities. In the case of my father's guarantor, she stood guard over him and, and said I've, she's rung the home office when it came to internment, but she'd heard the situation was out of control, so day and night she stayed with him for several days so that he shouldn't be hauled off to the police. So the guarantor is a really important person in the whole in the whole story, and the guy will always be um, somebody in Britain who lodged a significant amount of money with the authorities and um, 50 pounds. Um, There's a lot of money in those days, and um, but also would be an intermediary with the authorities as well. Um, yeah, just to quickly comment, we see a, a spectrum, uh, high numbers of Germans, obviously. Also large numbers of Poles who came during the war um, and significant numbers of Austrians benefiting from the relaxation of, of restrictions in, uh, during 1939. Um, fewer uh, Czechoslovaks, for example, for whom it was simply difficult to leave with the Nazis um, taking their countries chunk by chunk. Um, but still substantial numbers, and also there are smaller groups of Hungarians and Italians. And overall, yeah, really large numbers, I think. Uh, if we look at the Austrians in more detail, they're the group I've looked at particularly. Um, we can see that of these large numbers, um, significantly 291 nurses among them. There was, um, my target is I've identified roughly 600 refugee nurses. There should be a thousand actually who were given permission to requalify uh, or to qualify in British nursing. They wouldn't accept the, um, the continental nursing uh, 
qualifications. But we can see what a complicated structure it is. So Britain is both a place of refuge for some state, but also a place of a temporary safe haven. I mean, that's looking at it positively. Um, but these aliens tribunals was in 1939, the classification A, B and C. Uh, A and B is a very high risk um, category to be in. Um, that, that was a s scary experience. And we see a penguin special here on the internment of aliens, uh, supported by an Austrian uh, medical student, actually, Eva Kolmer. Um, a politically very active person during, during the war, ran, running the Austrian Centre, um, and part of an Austrian network, people like Edith Tudor Hart, and definitely on the, uh, on the communist side. Um, and we can see important statistics here, that the number of um, doctors um, put into Class C is 876, men, 60 women, um, so they should have been relatively safe, but it's interesting here having a statistic, uh, roughly a thousand at least of the refugee doctors occur in the official statistics. I think the government also lied about the extent of the presence of refugee doctors in order not to antagonize the British Medical Association. Um, so few polit I found very few political inter uh, internments in 1939. An Austrian nurse, Mitzi Hara, um, for example, um, for whom then internment long, longer term, the Isle of Man being thrown in with the Austrian Nazis was traumatic, uh, resulting in suicide attempts when she, she wanted to be interned with the Jews. That was her aim. Um, so that... Um, it's, it was for her a very psychologically a very distressing experience, but not so many in 1939. Um, but it is this post-Dunkirk -Dunk chaos with the dismissals of medical staff. Um, and these dismissals, some of the hospitals dismissing were keen to get rid of their, um, their refugee staff, but others were saying, no, 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 we want to hang on, we're going to have a, a gap in our services with all these excellent people, please, can we be an exception? Uh, so it's really interesting seeing the correspondence with the Ministry of Health. Um, and how quickly the situation changes, because in August 1940, the Ministry of Health recognizes the shortage of medical staff in the new emergency medical services and sees the rationale for having just in turn very large numbers for releasing them. So it is a very quick process. By August, the plans for release are already being put, put into place. But in the meantime, there are these horribly insanitary temporary internment camps like Wars Mills, for example. So before you get to the Isle of Man, you go through a chain of uncomfortable, of really horrible locations where it's overcrowded with nowhere to wash um, and uh, horrible toilets. So, yeah, there's, so it's a little bit two-minded. There's already conferences on the employment of refugee doctors. Um, again, interesting listings. Um, in May 1940, so it's so it's really from around the 20th of May, then just a few days later, to beginning of August, that the roundup and dismissal mentality takes hold of people. Um, and just a few examples of the sort of letters here. We have the Manchester University wanting to hang on to its medical students, who for whom it was necessary to do a year's clinical experience in order to get a British medical degree. So the Vice-Chancellor, no less, writes in support of, its, of the Manchester medical students. When it came to general internment in June 1940, the elderly and sick were meant to be exempt, but in fact they weren't. So, uh, and we know that medicines were confiscated, often dangerously so, conditions were horrible. But 
because the roundups had been so insensitively done, uh, the releasing of the sick was a priority. So between the 18th of August and the, I've got two, and the 21st of September 1940, already 2,072 persons on the grounds of sickness had been released. So that's large numbers. Um, the health care was actually came under a prison medical officer for the Isle of Man. And so again, completely inadequate. And if you were unlucky enough to be interned in Liverpool in Heighton, again, there was the public health services were meant to be responsible, but again, the services were disastrous. Um, if you were joining the British Army, the Pioneer Corps, that was a way of getting out of internment, you had a medical that worked slightly better. So um, you could volunteer, and if you were between 18 and 50, you would be eligible for military service subject to MI5 approval. And there is a great deal of the security services in the background. And interestingly, the security services were based at the Hydro Hotel in Bournemouth. So every request for release from internment had to pass through Bournemouth for approval. Um, this is what Heighton looked like. It was meant to be a new housing estate. Um, one of the best accounts, and again at the personal account, is that by the biochemist Max Perutz, um, later a Nobel Prize winner. But he sees something positive in every horrible situation he finds himself in. So he says, what are we doing? We're in this lightless room, totally overcrowded, and a fellow prisoner keeps staring at a blank piece of white paper. But, he says, what, he says, what he was doing was studying how to work out the distances of planets and stars from their parallaxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> an enormous scientific breakthrough comes from being in this horrible, overcrowded, dark room. So, um, I think, and I think that captures some of the spirit of certainly some of the inter of many of the internees to make the best of a making the best of a bad job. Um, how many are interned? As I said, the threat of internment hangs over everybody, but I think that a third to and a half is too is too many. If I just do head counts of the numbers of medical personnel interned, I'm only at 268. Certainly not enough, but um, um, it's uh, at least it's a evidence-based minimum number. Um, as I said, Heighton Camp is ironic. They have 26 doctors, all holding British degrees, previously employed, and yet they hadn't earned the right to, to practice. Dental services are withdrawn, so a horrible situation. Fortunately, the camp was closed down lasted another 18 months, but uh, it didn't last that long. Um, also, we find individual internment records being taken, in this case, from the Isle of Man to, to Liverpool for medical treatment. We find records of temporary release. Um, we find cases when, for example, an outstanding expert from Vienna Oscar Fair is able to operate successfully on a brain tumour at the internment camp at Seton in Devon. Wonderful work. Um, and case, so we have cases of many refugees actually taking a subordinate role in the medical, in medical care. Indeed, one biochemist from Vienna, Ephraim Rucker, uh, remembered it was a one occasion internment when he did actually practice medicine. Normally he was a laboratory researcher doing brain research. Um, so, <coughs> yes, refugees had limited, had a, a limited and subordinate role in the story. Um, we find certain home office directives. This is near relatives of internees from the home office in 26th of February 1941. Um, what to do if your relative is dying? <coughs> and we have tragic cases, there's one here when um, a letter's written to the internees 
um, saying, it seems the most senseless cruelty that you were not allowed to visit. This is about a person's father when the medical superintendent had taken such trouble <coughs> to tell the commandant and the home office. So tragic situations emerge in internment. And another tragedy is that of, and a great tragedy, is that of the Arundora Star when refugees are ship, being shipped off to Canada. And uh, later on, the, um, uh, the shipping off on another, e even when there was a replacement ship, the Ettrick to Canada, the refugees are locked in an overcrowded hold with hunger and dysentery. Um, so awful situations. Um, Perut says, it was an ant heap overflowing with vomiting bodies. So a horrible thing to find yourselves on, one, on, on such a ship. And even here, not surprisingly, under these circumstances, how a young boy becomes hysterical. And he's shot. He's shot by the guard. So absolutely atrocious treatment. And again, even worse, I think, is the, uh, the scandal was the hygienic conditions on the Danira um, and how the prisoners are treated. And I think what one has to take into account is, is that for the guards who were responsible, they're told that these are prisoners of war from Germany, that these are Nazi prisoners. And that was, more, that was the position, really. They were following the line of the British security services as a potential fifth column. And so no effort was made to say, no, these are refugees, these are anti-Nazis. So again, horrible conditions on the ship and violence from the crew and guards. And not surprisingly, under these circumstances, there's a suicide of Jakob Weiss jumping overboard. So, tragic mistreatment. But also gratuitous cruelty, insulin and false, false teeth being sh thrown overboard. Horrible. So, the Danira transportees going to Australia include 21 doctors um, and 11 dental surgeons. But the spirit of them is pretty impressive. There's a psychiatrist, Max Meyer Glatt, formerly a prisoner in Dachau. He has already managed to return to the UK by 1942, actually becomes an expert on the treatment of alcoholism at the Maudsley Hospital. Um, so a very successful career, uh, which he has then in British psychiatry. Um, some become guinea pigs for malaria experiments in Australia, remarkably enough. Volunteers, but still very tough. Um, what can we say about release? Release was, internment was collective. Release comes on an individual basis. So there is a lot of paperwork to secure release. Certainly, yes, the Ministry of Health has now swung round, is tired of this barracking from the um, British Medical Association. And Defence Order 1941, 32B, permits the registration of continental qualifications. That's an enormously far-sighted uh, measure to have taken during the war, this recognition. Um, and certainly we also have rapid release of doctors who were themselves ill. Ernst Adler, for example, from, from Edinburgh. The key role taken in this release by the Royal Society of Medicine as a committee for the release of aliens from internment. Um, there's a, um, a physiologist, a wonderful person, A.V. Hill, who had been one of the founders of the Academic Assistance uh, Committee in 1933 was then the independent member of parliament for Cambridge University. Every question that he asks in the House of Commons is about refugees. He was effectively the member of parliament for refugees, you could, you could say. Um, and he was also a very humane person. And my mother came as a young girl from Vienna on the children's transport and stayed in the family of A.V. Hill. So, which was, and it wasn't an academic family. So again, a very, very humane, significantly humane person. 
So how are you going to get this mass of very talented and unjustly interned uh, people out? So he sets up, he's with the Royal Society, he encourages the British Academy, the vice chancellors to have advisory committees, and for the physicians that the Royal Society of Medicine should set up its own committee and to take the opposite line to the British Medical Association. It was a very astute move, um, they were more academically oriented. And so here we see correspondence signed by A.V. Hill to the um, President Sir Girling Ball, the President of the Royal Society of Medicine, um, asking, them to, asking him to set up this um, committee um, so that um, and how did it work in practice? There was enormous paperwork to compile dossiers of the refugees interned. So I'll just show you some examples. One here is of Hugo Lichtenstein. And they find who's in the internment camp in Douglas on the Isle of Man, um, a colleague who can testify saying that he is popular and esteemed and successful and irreplaceable, and there is a real need to, um, for him to be released. Um, and we find a c continuous pressure um, coming from the, the, this combined group of the Royal Society um, and the Royal Society of Medicine on the Home Office to secure release from internment. So the civil servants, they go the way the, the way the wind blows, really. I think they're rather, my reading of them is that they, if you exert pressure, enough political pressure, they go the way the wind blows. So the, the wind is blowing strongly in favor of release. Here's a case of Heinrich Lauber, Jewish background, converted to Protestantism. He worked in the German hospital. This is the German hospital which Howard Rain has studied. And here we have a dossier compiled on him saying how Dr. Lauber was strongly anti-Nazi, was particularly concerned that the German hospital was a nest of Nazis. There was a particular pastor there who was a strongly, strongly Nazi. So for his anti-Nazi views, he'd been strongly victimized in the German hospital. And it describes this very, very fully in this dossier for release. Um, it says, yeah, although Dr. Lauber is not of the Jewish faith, he is of Jewish origin and he's always associated himself with Jewish refugee doctors and has always done all in his power to help these colleagues and Jewish charity patients. So that um, these, these carefully compiled and highly personal dossiers are really, I think, show the, um, provide vivid insight into particular people at that time. Here's some other examples, Martin Israelski, and again, there is a, to get him back as a radiographer in Leeds, radiologist, sorry, radiologist in Leeds, um, and uh, testifying, to his, testifying to his skills. Or David Teichman from Vienna University, and his outstanding work comes to England, stays first at the Kitchener camp, it's for collective, this collective uh, providing collective support for refugees and then um, um, being shipped off on the Danira to, to Australia. Oops. Um, but, okay, there are other cases that are certainly more problematic. Uh, this is from the Chief Medical Officer of Falcon Cliff Hospital in Douglas Isle of Man. He has an, an East a German refugee, um, originally Hans Winterstein, now he calls himself Henry Gillespie. He had the idea that if he joined the British Union of Fascists and went back to Germany, he would be protected. He also didn't do that well when he was being interrogated and spoke about his allegiance, how he still felt very much of a German. 
which was not such a clever thing to say. And so he's held, and he's held for about three years in internment. And so that it's unfortunate. He is practicing medically there. And one can see that there is a question mark over him from the point of internment, so that he, he is a problematic case. So it's, I think that it's a small justification for, the more new, for taking a more nuanced approach, but I also think he's exceptional as well. It's a strange thing to have joined. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. So we have this far-sighted decision made in December 1940 to recognize foreign medical degrees. We have initiatives for foreign academics to take British degrees. We have programs, for example, from the Royal Free Hospital for female refugees to come and qualify with us, or the Welsh National School of Medicine. And there is, during the war, a longer-term process for the restoration of clinical posts and new opportunities. I mean, you can take an example, Ludwig Gutmann, for example, outstanding at Stoke Mandeville um, in his uh, treatment of, um, in his orthopedic treatments. Um, and by 1945, we have 3,300 um, refugee doctors on the foreign list. So one, this is the positive side. So just to, to con uh, reaching my conclusion, so a few open issues. So are the initial arrests more to do with out-of-control police, or are they being steered by MI5? I think that's one question which I have. What about this myth of a refugee fifth column of enemy sympathizers? No basis for it all. Never was. I mean, um, okay, we just heard about Dr. Gillespie, but um, it really was, um, there was n nothing like that ever happened. Um, and then the horribly abusive treatment as enemies by guard. So is that being steered as well due to this psychosis which the security services had created. And what about the severe traumatization, the confusion uh, resulting from this confusion between Nazi and Jewish internees, persons finding themselves back behind barbed wire having been in concentration camps and separated from their families. So I think that's a need to go on to reconstruct the life courses of persons from persecution and how they were eventually re released. So, thank you very much. Thank you.